Hello, everybody. How is it going? Can you guys hear me all right? Uh, LRB is over, and I, I, or should be soon if he's not already. And I am here to save the day. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I hope you guys can see me all right. We're going to try uh, on location, uh, sunset in the woods. And uh, this, I'd like to touch on uh, the idea that we are over medicating our fish as a whole. Not in every circumstance, we'll go over that. And uh, yeah, we'll go over the details, but we wanted to, or I want to, uh, have a discussion with you guys and see what you think about the way we are currently doing things, the way the industry does things with medication, and if it's possibly just a ploy to get us to buy more medication, or if it's really done sincerely, uh, you know, one of those uh, decisions slash conversations to have. But beyond that today, if you guys would like to ask any questions about, <laughs> of course, your fish, your aquariums, uh, what I'm doing, uh, or any of the topics we discussed tonight, then feel free to, uh, and I'll try to get to those. Just try to use the at hashtag, or, or the at symbol, sorry, rather than hashtag. Um, try to use the at secret history living in your aquarium, or um, or also uh, at Alex, and I should be able to see those. Uh, oh, we already have a super chat rolling in. Thank you so much, Mr. Rico. Uh, I appreciate it. Rico Suave. Uh, Fish Fam Christmas is up to $1,600 and it's my fault. Well, ho, ho, ho. That is awesome to hear. Uh, Santa, you done did good. You taken the ball, the little imaginary ball that I threw you, and you ran with it. Epic. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys haven't heard... Uh, made fun of Rico the other night and now within what 24 48 hours whatever it was uh we have a fund of coming up on almost two thousand dollars uh for Christmas to to share and he will be distributing this giving it out to viewers and subscribers on channels all through the realm so check out Rico Stan's channel if you want to know about that or want to donate to that cause slash be involved with it and all that jazz. And uh, yeah, so let me turn this around real quick so you can see where I'm at. So you can see why we're on location. Um, not necessarily for this episode's topic or anything, but I just wanted to try it because the internet Comcast is supposedly fixing my internet or they're going to come out and reset the signal. They've already tried doing it remotely and all that. And uh so they're, they're going to hopefully try to reboot, reset, whatever. And because of that, uh, the internet sucks right now. It's just crap, complete crap at my house. And so I figured, well, why not go somewhere where the internet's okay? And I happen to know from uploading that it's usually okay here in this park. So uh, I figured I'd give it a shot and see how it works. And let me turn this, oops, let's turn this uh, rig around. Do 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 do, but up ba ba da ba ba do boo boo do boo do. All right, so this is my view, uh, just so you can get a sense for the amazingness that is before me. Um, so might be a little bit of something, like a little schmutz on the. Yeah, I have my own modem. I have my own modem and my own router. I've already spent like. $400 on that stuff put together um, in the last three months. But in this water right here, a lot of the fish that I've shown you guys the last month that are native, this is one of the spots that they come from. And right now with me talking and lurching over the water like I am, they won't, they won't be here. I mean, there might be some out swimming to and fro. And I know for a fact that right where... 
um, right where that kind of where the shadows almost touch here. Um, that is a bluegill nest and there's two bluegills that hang out right there every night. They've got like a little sandy nest there and it's pretty cute. And then they have some babies that they must have had earlier this year that are, that hang out right here in the periphery of all of this. And they live in that algae. And the other thing is we actually had some, uh, rain. And so the Creek has been flowing a little bit more. We had like a day of like misty rain like hardly any but it looks like it was enough that it this was all mud through here so it looks like the the water has raised maybe an inch something like that so i figure while we talk about this subject and while i answer any potential questions you guys have i figured we just walk through the woods and we just talk and you guys would have something better than just my mug to stare at but the first thing I wanted to talk about is the the idea that we're over medicating uh, our pets, our fish, and really the the reason I say that is think about when you get fish. So by the time you've gotten them, uh, you have already picked them up, and they've come from where? Let's go for let's go for a walk. Let's let's walk through the woods and go to. Uh, another lake, skirt this lake, go to a perch where a perch where we may see some perch, where we may see some bass, and then uh, a mosquito-ridden area <laughs> that I still like, even though there's mosquitoes there, because there's oftentimes turtles, and um, we saw a river otter the other day, so who knows what we'll find. But um, so by the time <clears throat> fish get to you. The fish have already been caught in the wild or captured if they're being bred into captivity. And this is another uh, plus side for fish captured, uh, or I mean, not, not captured, but rather captured bred, you know, tank raised fish, is that they don't need to be treated with medication as frequently because I, ideally they would already have medication that has treated their whole system uh, in the first place. So there doesn't need to be that initial purge treatment because I agree when you catch a wild fish, uh, say you're down in the Amazon, let's, let's go through the process of, of how a fish gets to you. If it's wild caught, like a little uh, Cardinal Tetra or something uh, that's neon Tetras. They're usually uh, farm raised now in, in uh in south florida or in indonesia or vietnam but the majority of the neon tetras are still all the different kinds are still caught in the wild and hey danikin thank you so much i appreciate it uh five dollars i really appreciate that he's down at the aca him and danny uh <laughs> awesome uh oh drew also cool. Uh, and, uh, I hope they're having a really good time down there. I wanted to go to that too, but, uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope you're seeing some awesome fish down there, uh, and report back to us. In fact, if you want, I'll even re relinquish part of, uh, the end of this stream slot if you want so that you could share it if you're up to it, but no pressure. Uh, but in any case, yeah, the uh, American Cichlid Association. Is that is that how it's titled? Cichlid uh, Association or is the A stand for some something else like, a, I don't know, get together, but that's not the word I'm thinking of. <laughs> uh, accumulation. <laughs> so interestingly, there's big old waves coming from somewhere on this lake right now and uh there's more ripples coming from right in here so this is the spot where i caught oh i guess i probably haven't uploaded that video yet but i caught a a rock bass that was about nine to t uh, nine to ten eleven maybe inches long almost a foot long and uh big red eye and nice spots all over it, good spines. 
And I caught it right off here with a fake worm. So just letting you know, this is the spot um, that that happened. But let's keep going. We're going to our tranquil spot. And uh, hopefully we'll get, we'll get somewhere where I can uh, stream you guys. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> What's that? Uh, not today, but I've caught bass and perch uh, here before. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, guys. Uh, folks walking on the trail, too, with their pups. So, in any case, go and catch a wild fish, and what happens? We're down in South America. Pretend we're in South America now. Oh, look at this water. Going to catch some fish. Catch the fish. Then they look at them. Any that are just obviously sick, they usually toss out. Then they'll throw them in a tank and let them sit for a week, two weeks, and they will observe them. And that's the best case scenario usually. More often than not, the turnover is that they know that they have a plane coming that's going to be picking up fish on Thursdays. So they've told all the local fishermen on Thursday, y'all better get your fish uh, collect them from wherever you get them and bring them to our, you know, 20, 30, 100, whatever it may be, aquarium shack. And they basically, they don't even filter their, their uh, aquariums in a lot of spots around the world. They just fill them up with water and each day drain them and fill them and have as many as they need at that time for however many fish are getting shipped out. So they'll do that, keep them for however long is needed to facilitate them getting them to their, the next place. And sometimes this is the spot where they're first treated with antibiotics and uh, antibiotics, uh, antifungal, antiparasitic, and salt and ick medicine, anything you can imagine that we treat fish for. A lot of places just slam them with a cocktail of all of that. Uh, okay. You got to get back to the uh, auction. I understand. Get us something cool, Kenny, like those rainbow polar ice cap Akaras. Those ones are pretty neat. All right. So you catch the fish. They're in the holding place. Say they're in a small, small town in Peru or Venezuela, Brazil, wherever it may be. And they medicate them there. Then they get flown out to the big hub like Manaus or um, Bangkok or Singapore. I, I mean, it just depends on where these fish are starting. If they're starting somewhere in Southeast Asia, then there's a good chance that they're going to go to one of the cities uh, and it, one of the big cities and that they won't be treated with medication until they get there. So in that case, you can, you know, count that they, they won't be medicated, but Usually these central hubs, they're not obligated to tell, I mean, they're not obligated or no, nor do they care if the fish were medicated before coming in. They just, they're not going to trust it. They want fish that are uh, purged. So they want fish that are uh, not fed for probably two days, ideally, and that have been dewormed and uh, given anti biotics, uh, antiparasitics, all that kind of stuff. Methylene blue, uh, Victorian blue, you name it. And that's where that, that's the bare minimum. So, uh, of where things would start off basically. So let's put this up against here. We're at the spot. I like, I know it looks like it's just sludge and green, but Believe it or not, there be turtles in here and osprey and bald eagles and other interesting critters that come and visit when you just hang out for a little while. All right, so we've got our, our collection point. Maybe already at this point, while it's still in Brazil or Singapore or wherever, it may be that they've already gotten two times they've already gotten antibiotics and they're generally like a very strong broad spectrum antibiotic same with the antiparasiticals they are usually something like uh levamisole 
So rather than flubendazole or fenbendazole um, or one of those that's kind of like sometimes uh, sometimes does the trick, sometimes doesn't, and we tend to use those, have access to those as hobbyists, they use hardcore stuff that is going to knock it out almost completely. And they don't care usually with most species if they kill even like one, two percent of the fish. That's not a problem to them. Uh, because you know, it's to them, it, they'd rather kill them there and not have to ship them and have more make it to the end because they're so cheap to buy from the wild. I mean, they're pennies on each fish. And so in any case, they, then they've got the fish that have been treated with really heavy duty stuff. And sometimes these fish are pretty sick. Sometimes they didn't need it at all, but I understand the logic of doing this. And it's kind of unavoidable and it's kind of, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's what is uh, prudent. Uh, there's actually a turtle way out there, but you guys probably can't see it. Um, but it's just, it's not moving anyways. It's just sitting there. You'll see it if it jumps off the log. It'll make a big splash in the, in the duckweed lake. This lake has covered up and sealed with duckweed in two days. Literally two days I've done that. It had, uh, if you look at my last picture on, um, on the community tab, you'll be able to see where this was all open still. There was a beaver that was working every day, working out here. And I'm sure he still is. You can still see trails of where the animals are moving through the duckweed, which is actually really helpful for catching stuff. Um, and they can't see me coming with the net, which are, we'll try later. Uh, and maybe we'll get some bass or some perch or uh, we could get crayfish, crawfish, crawdads, mud bugs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, those are a, a, a favorite here, too. So we've got the fish now collected in the wild. Or if it wasn't collected in the wild, say it was bred in a tank. Now it's at our exporter who is in a main hub. So maybe Frankfurt, maybe London, Singapore, wherever it may be, doesn't really matter. And that will be where they for sure hit it with the heavy duty meds and make sure that it's going to be treated because from there it's going to go to the U S and it may go to a trans shipper in the sense of it may land in LA after overnight, ideally, but it could be two or three days depending on switching and layovers and things like that. Fish could land in from, you know, go or go from Peru to L.A., however it works. Uh, they could land. Then they sometimes they sit in customs. Depends. The plane could get diverted. So usually what they'll do is they'll also medicate the bags with something like um, something like uh, uh, a sleeping sedative, you know, something that calms the fish down. And that also uh, neutralizes ammonia. So it's kind of like putting uh, Seachem Prime or one of those uh, water, um, what do you call it? Water, uh, like stress coat. Um, any case, conditioners, man, brain not working. Uh, so you've got that in the water too, plus all the medication. So you may have 15 to 20 different chemicals now in that water that the fish had never been exposed to. And even if the fish was completely well, it was being given this as a prophylactic basically. Uh, and now you get it in the country, the U S or if you're in Europe or Australia or whatever, wherever it's landing, then it ends up at a trans shipper or a wholesaler. If it ends up at a trans shipper, sometimes they will take it upon themselves, especially if they know it's going to be of several days, because oftentimes what trans shippers will do is a little shifty and they'll order in fish on demand. And so they'll order 15 rainbow fish uh, and you want Daniels and they say, give me two weeks and I'll have all those fish for you. If you buy anything online and you see that they're asking for time before buying fish like that you're going to know that they're a trans shipper and that they don't have a source that's ready in the country. They're buying most likely out of the country. It could be that they're sourcing something locally, but I mean, it's probably out of the country. So you've got people that are fine, like say Aquahuna or aquatic arts, people like that, that have their source in the U S and they're already 
um, established and things are waiting for you when you order. They're in the inventory when you order it. Boop, gone, you know. Oh, by the way, it started with two betas. Thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, for some reason, uh, YouTube and everything, views are down almost 50%, and it's across YouTube. I think it's because people, which is a good thing, are coming out and uh, exploring the world uh, without COVID. They're exploring, uh, well, it's still out there, but if you're vaccinated or whatever, you know, uh, if you take your precautions and all that jazz, you can go out. But in any case, so let's get back to the let's finish up this story. I know I'm meandering. So you get it to a wholesaler in the US, like Aquatic Arts, like uh, the Wet Spot, like Dan's Fish, something like that, like a, a, a retailer slash wholesaler kind of depends. Well, if they are someone like Dan's Fish, it's one less step, which is really nice. Or Aquatic Arts, they've got it in, there was no trans shipper necessarily, like they know the people overseas, so they skip that step. So either way, in certain places, it makes a difference, and that's why you pay more for fish oftentimes, because you will be paying for, you know, how many chains of distribution the thing had to go through. And counterintuitively, you might think, well, there's more people, so everybody needs a cut, but actually frequently in the fish world since they're living things that means that they are dead uh that they had to go through too much they got too stressed and they died uh so actually the shorter time there's kind of like a fine line between uh going through a bunch of hands like five hands between getting to you versus two or three and you know it it, it could be more expensive if it were two or it could be more expensive if it were six or I mean, it could be uh, or it, you could get it cheaper. I should say if it were all, like a ridiculous amount uh, because it would end up being that that, that many fish uh, probably die also in the midst of it. And that there's for some reason, like a wholesale outfit that took a long time to get to a small place, but they're probably working with someone huge like Seagrass Farms or something like that. But ignore that for now. That's not really that important. Um, so my point being is that now we've got where you caught the fish, the wholesaler in the country that's within a region that gets them together for the trans shipper. So that is anywhere from one to three medications and then, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Terry, I agree. I think that uh, Dan doesn't usually use a trans shipper. It sounds like he has sources that he then imports on his own and stuff. Uh, so that's what I'm saying is like that he saves money, but um, it doesn't always add up on his end to like, oh, he skipped a step. He took over that, the stress that the trans shipper or the, the labor the trans shipper would have had to take. It doesn't add up to money in his pocket necessarily always because he's, he's like doing the right thing. And uh, he may take that initial loss, for instance, on the fish that come in, because that's another little dirty secret of of this hobby is that no matter what you do, no matter how <clears throat> kind of a person you are and how much you try, if you're bringing fish in from outside the country, you're going to likely have uh, a lot of death, especially if it's shrimp or whatever. Uh, usually five to 10% is the acceptable amount from if you're catching it at the, the beginning of the, the food chain, so to speak, uh, out in the wild all the way until when it's harvested. Now, that's not counting all the ones that they toss out uh, in a canoe while they're actually catching the fish, for instance, that are like looking lethargic on the spot. So, that means that by the time it gets to you, and this is why it matters, you know, if you buy from Dan's Fish, if you buy from the Wet Spot versus if you buy from PetSmart, you know, because there's places like PetSmart that then will medicate. So they've, they've gone through all the same things and another step. So now they're at, they're at the retail store. And some local fish stores are like this. Some aren't. It just depends, too, on how far in they are, you know, um, away from infrastructure in Seattle. Luckily we are a very international city. We can get fish in our stores can literally wait at the airport, pick it up. And you know, if their stores within an hour, two, three hours of the airport, they can go two or three times a week and bring their fish in. But if you're in, I mean, I'm amazed that he does it, but like Dan in Wyoming, it could be more of a task. Probably there's probably less flights and things like that. 
So obviously North Dakota is going to have uh, probably more medicated fish because uh, uh, PetSmart uh, uses uh, the same. Yeah, Terry, PetSmart uses seagrass. I understand that. But what I'm saying is so when they get it, though, the difference is that oftentimes at PetSmart, they will then medicate again. And at my PetSmart by my house, both of the ones by my house, they medicate the whole system whenever they see anything, which is all the time, they medicate the whole system continuously. And that's like every three days or something, they use antibiotics again. And, uh, you know, every other day they use an antiparasitic because they have such sick fish in their cycle. Same with my pet, um, Petco. Now, I don't know if they all work like that. Probably not because I've seen how differently they can be run. But my point is that some of our fish are getting medicated. So at the store, I mean, even aquarium co-op, they get fish in, they medicate with the trio, but there are stores, uh, for instance, aquarium Zen that, that he'll watch the fish. If they don't have any illness, he's not going to medicate them. He already assumes they've been medicated to death along the route, literally to death in some cases. Uh, so, the question becomes, do you need to do you need to medicate those fish or is it overkill and it actually is detrimental to their health because of all the steps that have gone into it? And so that's, you know, kind of the question that I am posing to you guys. And to me, so you get your fish at the store, you bring it home and then a lot of people quarantine their fish again and medicate it again after their local store or their wholesaler they bought it from online or whatever already medicated. So in some businesses, I have seen up to six links in the chain, all of which did some sort of medication. Now, a lot of them don't do much medication and they don't care uh, in the lower level transshipper world because that's just the way it is in the developing world. You know, they don't have, they're going to do salt or something like that. But likewise, there's some that have access to industrial amounts of the same chemicals we do, erythromycin or whatever. Uh, and basically, they just dump in a whole a whole boatload. And just like Terry just said, you don't know the answer um, until you have the fish, like how many times it's been medicated. And so for me, I always prefer to put fish in a tank watch them there's people like aquatic arts that this is my preference i don't necessarily recommend it to others but i feel comfortable enough that i don't quarantine now i would tell most people quarantine 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 i have enough tanks with like 30 tanks now that oftentimes i'm putting in two or three species that i'm getting that day in a tank that already had one or two species in it and in that case like, should I put it in a quarantine tank or should I just put it in the home tank and I'm risking one other fish or two other fish? So there's other things at play uh, for, for the way my situation is. But uh, for your average person, I would say, yes, get a small tank, five, 10 gallon tank and quarantine your fish when you buy them. Um, but <laughs> at Legoland right now for someone's birthday, but I feel like this is more important. <laughs> I don't know about that, but basically I want to pose to you because we got some smart people in here tonight and it's good to see everybody. Uh, but I want to, to see what your opinion is on that because the other thing that's happening is we are getting, um, we are getting versions of, uh, whether it's staff or strep or whatever the bacteria is. And for that matter, we have, uh, whether it's bed bugs or lice or um, leeches, you can get even big complex animals and organisms that are a problem getting resistant to treatment. You know, cockroaches and rats. Some of them are resistant to poisons that are used in the extermination business, you know, and so they have to use more and more. Well, the same thing happens every time we don't successfully wipe out and treat an animal that is sick. So if you have a fish that has uh, a small bacterial infection on its fin and you treat it and it goes away and it looks fine, 
but that bacteria is still living on the surface of the fish colonized in the same way, but there's just no opening for it to get through the slime coat. That bacteria may have now just survived that treatment of antibiotics and may now be resistant to it or may need twice as much or three times as much uh, to kill it. And now if that goes, that fish goes in a week later into a tank with uh, another fish that has a cut, all of a sudden you have a fish that has three times, you know, it, it, and it may have gotten used to the bacteria too, but you have a fish that has a, a, a problem, a pathogen that is three times stronger. And so therefore the recommended treatments don't work. And we've seen this with MRSA in humans and, you know, staph and strep infections. Both of them have gotten really nasty over the years because of, overuse of antibiotics and under so overuse in general underuse in spec in specificity specific spec each occasion <laughs> um let's see alishan says there's a van that drives around the area northeast owned by russians from brooklyn they bring dozens of styrofoam containers uh with fish and show the contents bag by bag to the store owner uh, yeah, I mean, it just depends on where you're at, how things work. But I would guess that, um, in that case in Brooklyn, you know, you probably had a, a, a shipper that brought them in. I'm guessing with, with like, if you're saying it's Russian or some, you know, ethnic group that specifically working together, uh, on that basis, they probably are importing from say Ukraine or Russia or somewhere like that. And so they probably are the quote unquote trans shipper or receiving shipper. They probably are signing for it or are teamed up with someone else importing it. And so they're probably treating it themselves, or it really depends if they're really shifty and they're just going around town trying to sell fish uh, at a low price. There are plenty of small shops that will take a gamble and will take those fish. Now, what happens though, if those fish were also at a place in Kiev and they've been, these fish have been bred in captivity where they receive medication then they got sent to some small town uh, that was nearby or a city of, say, half a million people or, or a quarter million people. And then uh, they get treated there, they get bagged up, and they get moved for to Kiev for export. So that may be two medication doses there. Then uh, at Kiev, maybe something holds things up, and so they continually medicate the water there just to make sure that nothing gets through because they all use a shared system of water because it's way cheaper to do that, generally speaking. Uh, and that's why Petco PetSmart will do that. And luckily, I've seen a change recently. Sometimes they are not doing it where every tank is attached or they'll do a chain of 10 and 10 and 10 and 10 rather than, you know, all 100 or whatever hooked up to the same thing. But... Um, so then they export from Kiev, they land at from the airport, and maybe those people that are going around with the fish, maybe they're medicating them, maybe they're not. But it's such a difference between buying fish from a store like that that would buy fish from a van full of people with questionable origin, uh, the fish that is, uh, versus somebody who talk to a person on the ground. They know, hey, this whole week we're collecting in this region. We don't know what we'll have for sure. We're going to give you in theory what you could order, but it may change a little bit. Um, but it's whatever we catch locally. And they talk to that person. And then when it arrives, if you hear someone saying, oh, they switched me out this for this, that could be going on. Or it could be a sign. That's the hard part. As the consumer, you need to have a good relationship or there needs to be transparency in the production line, uh, in the retail sourcing line, because it could be that there was that going on. Or it could be that they actually are a trans shipper purchase. And because of that, they were waiting for other fish. And so then in that case, it could be that they're in a warehouse, cramped conditions, getting over medicated so that they don't die. Hopefully uh, they don't care if they don't, if they die in a week, they just don't want them to die that week or those five days until they get them off to the next uh, per person uh, in many cases. So that's why it's important to know like what's going on with that. Um, 
let's see here more comments uh, a lot of times the question is the problem we think about things the wrong way a lot of times we try to bandage an open wound what we really need to think about is the wound well so that's exactly what i'm saying too um the the other thing one is uh things like project piaba that tell you the origin of a fish i love uh, charities, projects like that, where they're using a region, they're using a resource that they're known for, the Cardinal Tetra, and they're saying if you buy these fish, that means they were caught by an indigenous or Amerindian person out in the Amazon. It was flown from this city. Uh, it wasn't thrown up the chain. They brought those fish in on the boat to the main export city, and then it may have a layover in uh, probably Peru, actually. Uh, and then it will come up to LA or wherever to Houston or, or I mean, uh, Dallas or Atlanta, whatever. Um, so in that case, you know what's going on. And Seagrest has started to actually supply some of those um, fish, which is great. Uh, I think that's a really good step. Uh, let's see here. J rock. Uh, there's a ton of info out there. Misdiagnosis is common. Doctoring is my weak spot. I've done tons of research. Wish there was a guide, uh, of tested remedies in one spot that was easy to find. Well, you know, I, that's the other thing about, uh, fish medications. And at first I was very mad because, Local fit, local big box stores have made it so that I cannot get antibiotics easily for my fish. It used to be that every store would sell you antibiotics locally, and it's erythromycin. It's a human-grade antibiotic. I've done videos on that talking about literally we've looked up the batch number, sourced it. Oh, okay, it's from uh, Purdue or whoever. You know, it's from a generic manufacturer, Teva, Teva, whatever. Uh and people have been taking that medication who didn't have insurance coverage. And it's an issue to have uh, that just out there. But to me, I'm of the opinion that people are going to people and, oh, well, uh, you say not for human consumption because they don't know what they're doing when they're dosing. And if they know what they're doing, well, then it'll be OK. And if they don't, then uh, it's not your problem, is my opinion. But uh, it's not that, you know, then it, then you get into other issues like, well, what if it's their children that they're dosing with these medications and the kids don't have a say in what they're taking? And that's where things I'm always like, well, maybe things should be restricted. But that's a whole discussion for another day. But my point being is at first I thought it was a bad thing. And now I'm realizing that there are a lot of ways to treat sick fish and i started doing something and i i wasn't sure if i was going to tell you guys about it honestly and i wouldn't have a problem talking about it on um maybe in an open forum or something but i wasn't just going to like up and post an episode so you guys are here you're listening to me chat we're kind of having a conversation if you will so i figure like now i can chat with you guys and what i did was basically nothing so i've been taking for the most part when my fish are sick doing nothing with them other than moving them so i've had two tanks one of them is full of plants with tannins and uh you know catapa leaves or local leaves that you can gather like oak leaves and alder cones and uh i mean you name it uh things with tannins basically and and uh it has clean water Water changes frequently, has aeration and surface agitation, and I'm feeding them live food. Daphnia or uh, mosquito larva or baby fish, whatever it may be, depending on the size of the fish. Uh, they're not getting any medication whatsoever. Now, I should clarify, if I know for sure it's ick or something, I just turn the heat up. That's it. I don't ever treat for ick anymore with chemicals. I just turn the heat up and call it good. Uh, but in, I mean, in this case, I'm talking about a guppy that looks like it's got a sunken belly or, um, uh, you know, a molly that's got a little fuzzy spot on the side, looks white, could be columnaris, could be something else. Um, 
there's certain diseases like flukes where, yes, I will use an antiparasitical or uh, salt depending on wh- how bad it is. Uh, and then I'll use this, uh, erythromycin because that is a secondary uh, to stop secondary bacterial infections from occurring. But what I've also been noticing this summer with collecting wild fish is I frequently catch wild fish and notice that where I hooked them in the mouth, the next day or two, they have an infection there. And if I don't treat them, they're going to die. Uh, and so that's bacteria in my aquarium that domestic fish don't seem to be bothered by when they get little injuries, but completely wild fish are much more prone to being sick. So that right there shows you that one, the, the domestic fish are probably more resistant to the diseases in the line Two, I mean, that fish that I just caught was, is going to be stressed. I, I grabbed it by putting a hole in its face and pulling it out of the water with a pole and then flopped around and then it was in a truck and then, you know, it's stressful. Uh, But it also just shows me too, like how much that affects them. Uh, And you know what? Also, I see another good point, which is uh, I use hydrogen peroxide. Uh, Melinda Lee Bowley says uh, I use hydrogen peroxide and, uh, I'm assuming, uh, for fungus and ick aspirin for severe stress. And in surgery, I use baking soda to anesthetize. Uh, I didn't know you could use baking soda for anesthetizing fish, but I do know that the hydrogen peroxide or isopropyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol (laughs) for that matter, uh, you can put on fish's wounds. And I've actually made poultices before, like made, I, take garlic, uh, mash it up into a little paste. And I've added things like, um, uh, um, let me try to think of exam. Well, I have added actual medications, but I've also added just things with like high tannins or tea tree oil or things like that. And I've tried over the years, I've tried a lot of different things, but you can use uh, a little bit of Vaseline, uh, like erythromyc, like, uh, or not erythromycin. Am I saying Neosporin? It's kind of like the equivalent of Neosporin. So if you can get that on their head, if they've got hole in the head, for instance, you treat them with the hole in the head medications, and then you can put that topically on them, and they're not in a tank with a bunch of stuff where they're going to rub it. I've actually seen that work okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you're right, John. John says. Uh, I think any light wound on a fish will get a light infection. I think you're right. I think there's a good chance that if your fish gets hurt, there's going to be a light infection on a, in a, in most aquariums. Uh, But I also think that is a testament to how dirty our aquariums probably are. Um, I mean, you've got fish from all over the world. And depending on the aquarium, like if you're like me, you may have fish from different continents, different um, sources, and they could have all six steps of where they were medicated. Well, those same six places can also be six places for disease. They can be six places uh, to pick up parasites or whatever. So in theory, the less hands that are on the fish, the better, in my opinion, and in most people's. And the more time that the fish gets to acclimate in between steps, the better. So that's why if, if, if I get, um, and the other thing is I should say that this, uh, my exception of where I have, I always treat fish is catfish and puffers, uh, as well as uh, some, you know, that's pleco and things too, obviously I always treat them with anti-worming, deworming, levamisol, um, or fenbendazole, something like that, anti-parasitic, anti, uh, and a dewormer, because they're almost always not fully clean from parasites by the time they get into the country. Um, because they eat off the bottom, I think it's something about maybe eating snails and eating refuse and so much protein, maybe the, in that protein in their gut, it gets bound up. And then uh, things like nematodes are able to f- flourish Oh, we have a bullfrog that's going wild right now. Let's see if we can find him. Uh, so, hey, 
what's up chubby guppy what's up zen how's it going uh and then uh <laughs> it started with two beds. it says one of my neighbors thought i was in a class lecture just now wow is it that bad uh is am i that boring tonight sorry uh Um, Terry says, uh, tropical tanks, ick and heat equals, I didn't kill it. I just don't see it. Well, it can't survive in its reproductive stage it past 84.2 degrees and you can kill it. And then within two weeks, it will die of old age also. So if you've treated it, uh, or kept the temperature up for two plus weeks, uh, then frequently that will, will just by process of that being its short lifespan, that will kill the ick. However, as you're saying, if you want things to go quicker, you, you'll turn up the temperature that will kill, uh, the, 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 um, so there's, when you get ick, there's the infection on the fish. And then these pustule things are basically eggs being laid and then they come off and, uh, come down into the water and then I guess they're not eggs. They're cysts. They're like the larva go and attach on the fish. So then those come off. And then at a certain point they go after they've fed on the fish, made this nasty wound, they go and they live in the uh, substrate and they are in their cyst form or basically, so cysts and eggs are sometimes interchangeably used, but generally a cyst, is a form where it's in stasis and it's a life cycle uh, step where that thing is basically in between larva and another more mature stage, but it is hard in a hard shell or something like that, or in a membrane, like an egg almost. Uh, but it's not, it's not the first step like where it's hatched. So like for instance, a uh, brine shrimp, you can get a cyst because the brine shrimp can lay cysts and that way they'll, those will be in the sand. And when a, a, a pond is drying out, those cysts will uh, survive and it, they will survive and dry out except for inside, but that layer on the outside will dry out. And then uh, that basically will, um, be, it'll, it'll send us a chemical signal. We can go over that in another video. It's kind of an interesting process actually, but basically sends it a signal to stop being in torpor, which is different than hibernation or stasis, which is different than torpor or hibernation. Uh, and it will then come out of that state and then baba, you've got little sea monkeys or seed shrimp, whatever you want to call them. Um, and same with Daphne and things like that. Whereas also they can give birth or lay eggs uh, from like when you look at them under a microscope, they've got these big ovaries or egg hold oviducts uh, that are holding clutches of eggs on either side of the Daphnia or on the, the sea monkeys or whatever. And then they'll, they'll lay those, those will go into the substrate. They'll hatch like a day or two later, um, sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 24 hours, and they'll come right back up really quickly. So that's for an ecosystem that is wet and staying wet for nine months or whatever. But at the end, in order to get some of those babies over the hump of a dry puddle or a situation like this where they run out of food or oxygen, they will uh, then form a cyst or almost like a cocoon and go into a dormant phase. Uh, Melinda says that uh, Daphnia can carry ick. I didn't know that. Uh, that is very interesting. Uh, wow. Freaky fish lady. Holly, what's going on? I'm glad you like this shot too. This is my happy place. Literally, uh, five blocks from my house. So, uh, I'm just enjoying it. Melinda also said eight day cycle. Uh, it has three stages. Yeah, definitely. Um, but the eight day cycle can be slowed down and there is variation. So I'm saying two weeks as, uh, Basically, I say 86 degrees in two weeks because 82.2 or 82.4 degrees will kill them or prevent them from reproducing. 
but uh, there's dips in your room at night. So why would you want to skirt on the edge? Or like we're talking about, because so many people have treated ick with turning up the, the heat on things and because 86 degrees or whatever it may be is an attainable water temperature in nature, um, obviously, and easily, you have to turn it up more. It's, it's an environment that if you had ick from the Orinoco Delta in the shallows, that they might be able to uh, deal with that. But for, for the most part, we don't have ick that deal with that because our aquariums are kept at a cooler temperature and they do better in that in that environment. Um, but yeah. Uh, so that is kind of what I wanted to tell you guys, but it's kind of another question of, I guess, I don't know. And and I don't know the answer yet in my mind, but I wanted to tell you guys about my little finding, which is that I was able to have almost the same exact success rate with treating fish uh, with nothing other than catapa leaf, so very strong tannins, acidic water, if they could deal with it, even guppies, I put them in 6.5 water. Um, but if, they, if it's tetras or something, I'll put them in, you know, 5.5 or 6.0 water uh, because that'll kill the bacteria for sure. Uh, it can kill the fish. It can kill the nitrifying bacteria. So there's a whole lot of other stuff uh, to uh, that can play into that. But uh, so don't just copy what I'm doing right now. This is a theoretical discussion, not a how-to discussion, right? Right at this moment, because I'm thinking though, please, people like a, a aquarium co-op where they they medicate with the trio for it used to be I think like it used to be a month, and then they realized two weeks or less or something like that could could be done. And they could get the gist of how things were doing, or maybe they started sourcing differently. I mean, I don't want to like misquote how it was done, but I know that it started as, and a lot of places start, we do 90 days or 30 days, and then the, it goes to two weeks, and then it's like five days, and then it's like, uh, we medicate our fish and make sure they're well, and then that could be a day. Well, of course, if uh, Aquarium Co-op were to get something from Dean, you know, he's been at Dean's house. He knows that Dean is a good breeder uh, in the Seattle area who's already treated anything, probably at a at a more scrutinized level than a shop could because he's working with the fish every day. Uh, but that's where I'm struggling is do we actually medicate at the shop level, let alone at home? I, I never medicate unless there's something visually wrong with the fish. Or it is a puffer or a bottom feeding like catfish, some loaches, um, just because I've seen so many times them have something lurking and then them pass it on after they've been, been in quarantine. They've been hit with levant or uh, levamisole will almost always kill worms and, and nasties in the gut. But uh, yeah, so the other ones though, fenbendazole, flubendazole, Sometimes those don't. And so you think you treated it and the stuff you'd get at the store, you think you treated it and then you put it in another tank, uh, boom, and it's got something else. The other exception to all this, it would be like Columnaris, Vibrio, those two, two um, MRSA, if it's on the fish uh, in a wound, like those are some nasty, nasty um, pathogens that you're just, yes, there are ways to treat these things, but there's a high likelihood the fish is going to die no matter what you decide to do. And in that case, I've been putting them in a tank alone with tannins, with air and with live food. And I have found that they survive at about the same rate as the other ones that I put in a tank uh, where I'm medicating them. And if you add the tannins and the air stone and all that, or salt dips, depending on what the issue is, if it's, you know, an exterior issue, uh, combined with that lit, that way of living, you can really make a big difference. Um, yes. G goldfish also a citizen, definitely good point. Goldfish also won't handle a uh, low pH very well. No, they won't. Um, they can be, acclimated to that um you can find them in crazy swamps and things out in the wild but uh like invasively but they're 
biologically, yeah, you don't want to just toss them in that it's, it's an overtime type thing. Same with guppies. I mean, you don't want them to be much under 6.5 or so, or they'll start getting sick pretty quickly generally. Um, so to end this, uh, live stream, which, uh, I wanted to put this out there. I want you guys, if you watch this later in the comments, I'd like to hear your opinion about this. Uh, how many steps do you think is the max you should, we should allow as a standard in, in the hobby? I think really, I would never go over four people handling a fish. Um, it's just not worth it. No matter what the fish is to me, I don't, I don't like doing that and I won't source my fish from places like that. If I know of it, um, that being said, uh, you know, shrimp are a whole other thing too, where LO biopsidae was a, an illness that was getting passed on. And, uh, the green, the green algae illness. Well, now there is a cure for that. Thankfully, um, they had the genome sequenced actually, uh, um, Rachel O'Leary got a bunch of samples and sent them to them like three years ago, I think now, two years ago. And she just recently sent me the lab type up that they came up with on a treatment protocol for farms and all that too. So hopefully they can knock the LEO biopsidae out. Um, that would be great. But yeah, I'd like to hear from you guys. Uh, again, thank you so much for those of you who super chatted tonight. That was very kind of you. And uh, those of you who are watching, those of you who are lurking, who are engaged, thank you guys. I mean, you guys make the channel what it is. Jess Shrimp Granny, it's so good to see you back again. Uh, new member right on. Welcome. Uh, that's really cool. Um, Jess is someone who has checked in with the channel from time to time for years. And so friendly face that I remember from when the channel was very young. And same with Zen Ginger. I mean, same with a lot of you. But uh that makes me smile so welcome welcome let me know if i can do anything to make your experience better um <laughs> but uh let's see here so uh you're welcome uh carolyn too i hope your fish are doing better than in the the in the comment that you sent me or in the email that you sent me uh, or i hope everything is doing well let's just put it that way um but i'm not going to leave you just yet i just in case I, I kick the tripod over or whatever, if you guys want to hang out for a sec and see what, uh, what I get out, wait, I'm not even pointing at the right thing. Uh, what I get out of this water, out of the water. If I was in Boston, I would be getting it out of the water. Um, turn around camera bonk. All right. So yeah, but as always, thank you guys. Uh, so I'm done with my hour long rant on the production line. A little meandering at first, but uh, I don't know. It's one of those days where it's hot and I was kind of just walking through the woods, but let's, let's get you guys set up. Uh, and then we'll flip this thing out uh, where you guys can see what I got or didn't get uh, in the net. Um, let's see. Here. Can I find some ground where the tripod can sit and not flip out uh, tripod where are you gonna be happy mr tripod mr tripod there we go still might fall over but whatever All right, and the fun begins, guys. Watch me get stung or bit by everything in here. Let's take a closer look. All right, so you guys are going to explore with me. All right, let me see here. Ugh. So what is, uh, yeah, I should have brought my other tripod that is flexible for trees. <laughs> Lots of bugs. 
Lots of little bugs. Uh, lots of little water bugs. Last night here, I caught a crawdad. Um, crayfish. Lots of duckweed. Not so much a ton of algae, though. But there is this sort of pre-peat moss. Um, it's myriophyllum and Eloidia that is just old and wet and mucky. And then we've got a leech. Let's see if we can show you that up close. There's a leech in here. Um, he just went back in. But we've got lots of leeches here in this little lake. And then we've got a dragonfly nymph right here. Let's see. I'll lift this up so you guys can see it. Um, where is he? Where did he go? He might have fallen. I'm actually being so slow with y'all present that, uh, oh, hey, look at that. Look what we uncovered right there. So here, we've got a bass. This looks like a largemouth bass. And uh, you can tell because his mouth comes back behind his eye. But what a pretty little fish at sunset. Little blue on him, green. He's got yellow on his tail. We'll get him in some water. That's surprising. He was under that, under that uh, duckweed. Let me make sure there's no other fish under here. There's catfish under here routinely like that that you want to make sure uh, that you didn't get them trapped. So let me get him water real quick. I think we're good, though. I think he's the only buddy we're going to have to worry about. So we're going to get him some water, water, water. But we're going to have to do it over here because I can't get to the bank down there. Oh, what a pain. What a pain in the membrane. I got to set you guys down. Ugh. Okay. All right. Mr. Bass, back into the water you go. Up. <laughs> the duckweed's so thick. He didn't even go in at first. Boy, he's, hey, oh, that's two bass. How do we catch two bass? All right. And the nice thing about bass is I got a fishing license that says I can have them. That was internet speak for I can own them. Just want, always like to double check that there aren't baby minnow in here. But like I said, this is what makes this spot so great is that the fish that were in here, I didn't even know they were in here. I mean, I couldn't see that they were in here. Collection-wise, it was a blind guess. Uh, by the way, I feel obligated, even though they're sold out, to tell you that these nets, uh, these nets are from uh, Jonah's Aquarium. And uh, he does uh, native fish, too, that you can buy, like actual pet native fish. So... I figured I should give him a shout out because he sent me this net uh, for free for a video that is already created. But he's sold out at the moment 
because it's a freaking good net that people buy from Europe and Germany and all over the place. Uh, I like that there's Germans who order this thing. Like there's a bunch of explorers that are German, like seven or eight that order them for their friends and for the collecting parties when they hire them to go out. And you know, if the Germans are buying something that's like a tool or mechanical, they've conceded in there, like the German made stuff is the best. And, uh, they're, 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 they have to admit that the American or what, wherever the heck they're getting it from is, is good. So let's try another spot. I'm going to try shallower water. That was about two feet of water. Um, let's try this again in, in less. So this will be about six inches to a foot of water. All right. <clears throat> so, hey, we've got a beautiful, beautiful bluegill. Little one. But look at that. Look at that blue on him. He is a blue bluegill. Boy. Beautiful. Let me go get my container. I've gotten my technique down. Uh, I should thank Lawrence uh, Kent, who's collected all around the world. I should thank him for teaching me some of this, which is J strokes like a canoe paddle. And you go one way towards the shore, pulling it in, scrape the bottom. And then the fish will be, it'll be a cloud of muck. So the fish will go out that way, that way, that way. Well, a lot of fish, their tendency is to go out the way that the danger came from, like double back. <laughs> Shrimp do this too. And so frequently, that's what will happen is you'll find the fish in the stroke of collecting the water that you already uh, disturbed. So, depending on where you are, be careful with going through this. Like, because of these, they can munch on you kind of hard. That's what the big bass are eating. That's why they're our baby bass, is because of these little monsters that they uh, partially base the predator aliens on. Uh, in fact, I have a picture on the community tab. I believe it's on the community tab on YouTube where there is a dragonfly nymph, one of these big ones. This is like medium size. Um, also you get a lot of bees that are floating dead in the water, but this dragonfly nymph, I've had these, this size, um, come over I mean, not just dragonfly nymphs, but lots of bugs come over and eat a fish like that one that we found. They'll eat a fish while it's out of water, while we're still going through the net. So um, they're no joke as far as their, their, their mandibles and their ability to mess a fish up. Also, we've got freshwater mussel right here, a little black one. Ugh. So, yeah, um, that would be true, Texas fish. Um, if this water were on the map, um, this water is not on the map. Um, besides the fact that I'm collecting them to take pictures of them on the shore 
so I'm not really worried about it. I may take one home for a night or two usually, but most of the time I don't take anything home. Um, but yeah, if I caught this with a net, like out on a lake that's known or something, this is a wetland that doesn't even get listed as having any fish. It's just a bog or a whatever. It's a green belt. That's all duckweed. Not even bugs in that. Um, but yeah, so technically if a game warden came right now, I'd probably be in trouble. They, they definitely scrutinize the bass. But the game fish, does not so much the net since it's a personal dip net, but if you had a sang net, oh man, you'd be in trouble for a sang net. That's, yeah. Like if you net it off a river. Um, and then a bow here is very illegal. And if you have more than two lines, very illegal in Washington. So kind of odd regulations. But where we're at right now, I mean, nobody's coming here. Uh, like it's not even a known like I said, it's not even listed as a recreational fishing spot, uh, like with water or stocked fish or anything. Um, All right, so this is probably the last scoop we're going to do. Yeah, if it's private property, you can definitely keep any fish you catch, too. All right, this feels like it's just going to be duckweed, but I could be wrong. I was wrong with the two bass. Got a muscle. You know, sometimes you can get newts and uh, bullfrogs and tadpoles, you know, salamanders. But not this time of year, I haven't found any in this body of water. And if I found... Most of the newts that are native around here, it, I would then be obligated to put it back because most of them are protected. So, the duckweed, someone else comes here and catches crawfish because I see traps out here a lot. Um, let's see here. So, this activity always makes me sweat. That net usually weighs about 30 or 40 pounds. <laughs> it's filled, it's a five gallon bucket filled with water. So, what, eight times five could be 40 pounds if it was filled with water, but it's filled with mud and rocks and duckweed and bass, hopefully. Uh, it's also 80 degrees today. So in any case, what I'm trying to say is it's not easy to film and do this. Maybe my wife will come out here and we can film and do it again. But I just wanted to give you guys a little wee bitty taste of uh, what I do for fun in the summer and uh, collect non-invasive plants from places where it's allowed, which is getting trickier. But thank you so much for the support, guys, um, for watching Thanks for sharing, liking, all that stuff. Appreciate the thumbs up tonight. And uh, I hope you guys uh, have a good evening. I'll talk to you guys later this weekend, probably with a video upload or uh, my wife's gone tomorrow. So there's a chance that I may take you out with Lawrence Kent and I. Uh, he's also going to be speaking, I think, for the Aquarium Co-op. Like if you join their membership, channel membership, I think... Uh, 
I don't know what level you have to be five or ten dollars or what it is, but um, he'll be speaking for their online fish club. So maybe we'll get some nuggets from him for free, <laughs> you know, um, because he's come out with me several times now. We're going to look for the banded uh, killifish, hopefully, I think tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, he just got back from Arkansas, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, like, I think he did a whole little loop of area down there. So I'm excited to see what he brought back, if anything, because while he was gone, raccoons ate his native fish up here in Washington, like some of them. So uh, that might also be an episode to show you guys what he caught down there um, while he was down there, uh, where I know a lot of y'all live closer to that end of the country. The bottom end, <laughs> the bottom central end. All right, you guys, you have a wonderful night. I'm going to get out of here uh, and call it an evening. Um, if you have questions about Washington State fish collecting law, Jax and Tax probably knows way more than me. I'm just going off of what like park rangers and wardens and different people have told me like while I'm out already doing the thing wrong that I'm not supposed to be usually and they're like well you can do this but don't do that or you can do this here but you should go over there to do that that kind of thing uh, i look up the laws and they don't seem to make sense to me uh, a lot of times they contradict themselves sometimes they apply to things that aren't in the state even um be, like preventatively and sometimes they like count as you can catch it as a bait fish and you can keep it and use it as a bait fish if it won't be released live. So if you kill it once you catch it, you can use it as a bait fish. But and I think this is for pike minnow, northern pike minnow specifically. That would be my guess. But you can keep it if you kill it and chop it up. You can use it as bait. But you can't uh, release the fish for one. Uh, you're not supposed to have possession of a live fish ever or transport or buy, sell. Uh, how is the fish ever? And uh, I don't know how else it goes, but you can fish for them any time of year, but it's illegal while you're reeling it in, technically speaking, on the books. Like, you have to kill it. So it's a really weird thing. I guess you're not in control and custody of it yet until you get it, but you better kill it real quick. So there are some bait fish that are weird. Like, yes, you can use them as bait fish, but don't you dare bring them home and raise them as pets or you are breaking the law, breaking the law. All right, guys, I'm out. Have a wonderful night. Take care. Bye.